in Alabama. He earned a degree in business administration from Troy University and a Master of Aerospace Science from the Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. He has served extensively in the aviation and historical communities. He's been chair of the board of directors of the Alabama Aviation Hall of Fame, the Southern Museum of Flight, and the National Soaring Safety Foundation. He has served as president of the Chilton County Chamber of Commerce and currently serves as the mayor pro tem of the city of Clanton and as a member of the Chilton County Airport Authority. Here at the archives, Billy has been really meaningful to us. He has facilitated uh, the acquisition of some fantastic aviation collections, none more significant than the one that he donated, which is an amazing uh, uh, set of materials on civil aviation in Alabama. Uh, he's a former member of the board of directors of the Friends of the Alabama Archives and has helped to bring other friends and donors to us as well. Uh, he's been a great friend of the archives. I count him as a great personal friend, and you're going to enjoy hearing from him today. While you're here, you're going to want to pick up a copy of his latest book, Hidden History of Alabama Aviation. We've got uh, copies available for purchase, and I know he'll be glad to stick around for a few minutes and talk to you and sign a copy of the book. Please welcome Billy Singleton to the archives. Thank you, Thank you, well, I obviously didn't deserve that introduction, but I, I appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for taking part uh, of your day to allow me to share with you an extraordinary chapter in the story of aviation in Alabama. Now, living in Clanton, Alabama, I spend a significant time, amount of time on Interstate 65. And like you, you've probably seen the license plates on the automobiles from Ohio. And there's a tagline that reads, birthplace of aviation. And that, of course, refers to the Orville and Wilbur Wright being from the city of Dayton and doing a lot of their preliminary experiments uh, in their bicycle shop there. You also see the license plates from North Carolina that say first in flight. Again, a reference to the Wright brothers conducting the first sustained and controlled flight of a heavier than their machine of the sand dunes of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. I think from time to time how interesting it is that when the Wright brothers chose or decided to establish the nation's first civilian flying school, they didn't return home to Ohio, nor did they go to the Outer Banks of North Carolina. They came to the genial climate and suitable terrain of central Alabama, establishing their school on land owned by Frank Cone, just about three miles west of where we sit today. And even though the Wright brothers believed that their invention would make future wars virtually impossible, in April of 1917, the United States found itself in the first global war, a war in which the airplane would come, become a very important weapon. Like the Wright brothers, the Army Air Service at the time selected land in the Pike Road community just southeast of us to establish one of 14 primary training fields for military aviators during the First World War. And even though President Woodrow Wilson believed that World War I was the war to end all wars, just over two decades later, America found itself embroiled in a second world war. And the state of Alabama would become a critical component of President Franklin Roosevelt's arsenal of democracy. With 10 training fields for pilot cadets throughout the state providing pre-flight primary uh, basic and advanced training, the skies over Montgomery were described as having the densest air traffic in the entire world. More than 100,000 pilots, navigators, and bombardiers attended pre-flight training at Maxwell Field alone. At the conclusion of the war, we saw the establishment of the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville that helped develop the uh, Saturn V rocket that delivered and transported humans to the moon. Thereafter, we've seen the Airbus U.S. manufacturing facility in Mobile that produces the world's best-selling transport aircraft. We have more than 300 aerospace firms that have made the decision to establish or expand their businesses in the state. While aviation may not have been conceived in Alabama, and although the very first flights may not have been made here, 
I submit that Sweet Home Alabama is the heart of aviation and aerospace in the United States. Throughout this remarkable history, Alabama aviators have recorded many notable achievements. I'm extremely pleased today to share with you the story of two aviators who earned world acclaim for their daring exploits during the golden age of flight. In 1921, aviation pioneer Eleanor Smith wrote, to some young women with dreams of a wider world, there seems to be two paths to follow, each with great romantic appeal. One leads to Hollywood, the other to a career in the sky. Now, I believe this quote is especially appropriate as a means of introducing Alabama's first ladies of flight, Catherine Stenson and Ruth Elder. For a significant part of the first century of powered flight in the United States, it was extremely challenging and difficult for women to achieve success in the male-dominated aviation industry. Rigid social expectations prevalent during the early 20th century. Branded aviation is not only an inappropriate activity, but even a physical impossibility for women. However, these constraints would not deter Catherine Stenson and Ruth Elder from establishing their equality as aviators and earning their rightful place in aviation history. Now, Catherine Stenson was born on Valentine's Day in 1891 in the small farming community of Fort Payne, Alabama, the oldest of four children. At the age of 13, Catherine's parents, Edward and Emma Stenson, separated. Although her parents would never divorce and her father maintain a presence in, uh, with a relationship with family, Emma Stenson would become the dominant influence in Catherine's life. A self-confident, self-assured, and ambitious parent, Emma Stenson rarely applied restrictions or enforced conventional rules in raising her children. In a 1917 interview in the American Magazine, Catherine revealed that mother never warned me not to do this or that for fear of being hurt. She never reproved my sister and me for playing with boys. I believe this was a significant influence in the development of Catherine's self-confidence and sense of equality. Early in life, Catherine displayed a talent for music and dreamed of becoming a, music, a concert pianist and a music teacher. During her teenage years, she continued to develop her talent through musical classes and one year spent in a music conservatory. However, a trip to Kansas City in 1911 would significantly alter those plans. While visiting friends, the 20-year-old Stinson read an article in the local newspaper relating to balloonist Harry Eugene Honeywell, who would be performing exhibition flights over the city. To demonstrate the safety and reliability of the balloon, Honeywell proclaimed that he would take four women aloft the passengers would be randomly selected from a list of 150 volunteers. Now, whether it was by uh, divine intervention or sheer luck, Catherine was one of the four females selected to be taken aloft. Once airborne, she was amazed at the freedom she felt as she peered over the side of the gondola at the city below. Her interest was further stimulated the following year when she accompanied a local aviator on a local flight near her, uh, Hot Springs, Arkansas. The freedom she felt in the air, combined with her keen sense of adventure, convinced her to abandon her musical prospects and pursue a career, career in the sky. As she began her quest to become an aviator, Stenson visited flying schools in Hot Springs and St. Louis, but was unable to find a mentor willing to teach her to operate a flying machine. Eventually, she visited Cicero Field near Chicago, where she met Swedish immigrant known to local aviators as Max Lilly. 
Initially, Lilly refused to take her as a student because he believed that Stinson, at five feet in height and weighing 100 pounds, was simply lacking in sufficient strength to manipulate the controls of the flying machine. However, Stinson used her powers of persuasion and $250 in cash to convince Lilly to set aside his bias and accept her as a student. Now, I always like to point out this picture looks a bit staged with Lilly holding on to the strut there, but that's not unrealistic because the early flying machines did not have seat restraints. And if it looks like he was holding on for dear life, he in fact was. Uh, little was known about the forces acting on the airplane at that time. And so it would be uh, later before the restraints were put on the airplane. And several early aviators were fatally injured when on a hard landing, they'd be thrown from the operator's seat. So I think that picture in itself describes the courage that Catherine Stinson had even pursuing this. Catherine Stinson quickly earned the reputation of being a meticulous aviator who was very particular about the maintenance and operation of her aircraft. She would frequently scold her instructor, Max Lilly, because of the poor mechanical condition of the aircraft he operated a lesson he apparently didn't take very seriously because in less than two years, he would be fatally injured in an aircraft accident that was a result of an in-flight failure. In July 1912, after four hours and 10 minutes of instruction, Stinson operated the machine without the assistance of an instructor for the first time. In a true test of her skill, the engine of the machine failed on her very first flight forcing her to make an emergency landing without engine power. Three days later, Stinson performed a figure eight maneuver and made an ascent to an altitude of 500 feet to qualify for a license issued by the Federation Aeronautique Internationale. The international organization established to advance the science and sport of aeronautics prior to a licensing authority being created in the United States. In completing the test, Stinson became only the fourth female aviator in the United States to earn a license to operate a flying machine. Tragically, two of the women who preceded her were killed in aviation accidents in the weeks before she began to fly. The, a third soon retired from flying, leaving Stinson as the only licensed active female aviator in the United States. After earning her license, Catherine and her mother would invest $10,000 to form the Stinson Aviation Company. The firm was established to manufacture, sell, rent, and otherwise engage in the aircraft trade. The first asset obtained was a Wright Model B flyer purchased from her friend and mentor, Max Lilly. The Stinsons planned to earn money performing aerial exhibitions at uh, aviation meets, county fairs, and other public gatherings. By the summer of 1913, Stinson's career had literally taken off with appearances across the Midwest United States. Newspapers across the country reported with long black hair cascading down her back, the curls adorned with colorful ribbons, the petite Stinson charmed crowds wherever she went. A reporter for the Kansas City newspaper described the five foot, 100 pound Stinson as a young woman who appeared not a day older than 16. Because of her youthful appearance, event organizers began to promote her as the flying schoolgirl. To keep that image alive, her age was kept a secret. During her career as an exhibition pilot, Stinson became the first female aviator to perform several difficult and dangerous aerial maneuvers. In July 1915, over Cecil Field in Chicago, she became the first female to perform an aerobatic loop in an airplane. She was also the first to use smoke canisters attached to her airplane to generate aerial advertising. And I wanna stress just how miserable these conditions were. Where she seated, here's the engine that just made an off racket and two big propellers behind her. This is the fuel tank. And she's sitting exposed to the elements. 
I often got tickled seeing an oil can over here that they used to lubricate the engine before she took off. But they flew these airplanes winter and summer. Now, most of Simpson's pioneering flights were made to advance the science of aviation. In September 1913, she became the first woman authorized by the United States Postal Service to transport mail by airplane while appearing at the Montana State Fair in Helena. In November 1914, she became the first aviator in Alabama, not the first female, but the first aviator to successfully deliver mail by airplane when the postmaster of Troy authorized aerial service from the Pike County Fair. Stinson would fly from the fairgrounds to a spot near the post office where she dropped bags containing mail to a postal employee on the ground below. In 1913, the Stinson family relocated their aviation company to San Antonio, Texas, where they provided training for civilian and military aviators. Family members Emma, Marjorie, and brother Eddie operated the school while Catherine assisted when not touring as an exhibition pilot. Catherine's sister, Marjorie, oops. Oh no, you're right would become the ninth licensed aviator in June 1917 and was a primary instructor at the Stinson School of Aeronautics. Because of her role as a supervisor of the school, she earned the nickname, the Flying School Marm. <laughs> Today, Stinson Field in San Antonio remains in operation after more than a century of service and is named in honor of the Stinson family. In December 1916, Catherine Stinson would earn the reputation as a world-renowned aviator when she sailed for Asia to fulfill a six-month contract to perform in Japan and China. At the time, 90% of the people of Asia had never seen an airplane. Initially appearing before 25,000 spectators for night aerial exhibition in Tokyo, Stinson became the first female aviator to appear in the skies over the Asian continent. Hailed as the Air Queen, Stinson drew huge crowds during her performances throughout the country. During night flights, she performed aerial loops, which you can see from this postcard of the era. As a female aviator, her presence in a society that restricted women to subservient roles created great enthusiasm throughout the country. Stinson would later write that the women have simply overwhelmed me with attention and seemed to regard me as their emancipator. Between appearances, she would visit model airplane meets and receptions at newly formed Stinson clubs created in her honor often appearing in traditional Japanese attire. In China, Stinson performed for the Chinese president, who was so impressed that he bestowed upon her the title Granddaughter of Heaven. In April 1917, her Asian tour would end prematurely because of the declaration of war by the United States against Germany in Europe, elevating the conflict to the First World War. Arriving back in the United States, Stinson began to lobby military leadership to allow her to participate in the war effort by volunteering for the Army Air Service. The response was polite but firm. Females would not be accepted for combat service and need not apply. Undaunted, Stinson began to seek other opportunities to do her part. In June 1917, she volunteered to assist in soliciting financial contributions to the American Red Cross by making a publicity flight from Buffalo, New York to Washington, D.C., with appearances in New York and Philadelphia. Departing on the 24th of June 1917, she used railroad maps to navigate a procedure known as following the Iron Compass. While bombarding towns along the route with pamphlets urging citizens to contribute to the Red Cross $1 million fund. The airplane used for the flight, a Curtis JN4 Jenny military trainer, was equipped with a small mirror in the cockpit to allow her to present a clean appearance free of oil and grime discharged from the engine before greeting crowds at each stop along the route. More than 5,000 spectators greeted her at her arrival in Washington, 
Before landing, she would perform aerobatics and other aerial maneuvers for the crowd. Because there's no airport at Washington, Stinson landed at the polo grounds near the Capitol building. She was then escorted to the Capitol to deliver $2 million in pledges to Secretary of the Treasurer, William McAdoo. Her flight that day covered 670 miles in 11 hours of flying. The trip included landings in seven cities. On December 11, 1917, in another demonstration for, of her ability as an aviator, Stinson departed from North Island near San Diego, California. After flying 610 miles nonstop in nine hours and 10 minutes, she set new aviation records for both distance and duration before landing in San Francisco. Because she had neglected to carry food on the flight, she would later joke that she was the first person to fly from, uh, to travel from San Diego to San Francisco between meals. <clears throat> Frustrated and being unable to participate in the war effort as an aviator, <clears throat> Stinson would join an ambulance service organized under the American Red Cross. She traveled to France shortly before the end of the war. Following the armistice, Stinson received permission to conduct airmail flights for the U.S. military between Paris and Germany. Before she could begin the flights, however, Catherine contracted influenza and would subsequently develop tuberculosis. Near death, she entered a sanatorium in New York in hopes of recovering. Learning of the benefits of the dry New Mexico climate, she relocated to Santa Fe, where she would spend the remainder of her life. The effects of the disease would do what rigid social expectations of the early 20th century could not permanently ground the flying schoolgirl. Stinson would re spend the remainder of her life designing beautiful structures as an architect in New Mexico. In 1959, she suffered a debilitating stroke that severely impacted her health and mobility. After years of declining health, she passed away peacefully on July 8, 1977, at the age of 86. Now, although her physical presence has passed from this place, her life, her achievements, and her memory are memorialized in the National Aviation Hall of Fame, the International Air and Space Hall of Fame, and of course, the Alabama Aviation Hall of Fame. For Ruth Elder, the path to a wider world would not only lead her to fame in the sky, but on the silver screen as well. Ruth was born in Anniston, Alabama on September 8, 1902. Friends and relatives of the family often describe the young Ruth as a flamboyant and extroverted child who seemed to be destined for greater things than the small community of Anniston could provide. Following graduation from high school, Elder left Anniston for the excitement of the city, moving to Birmingham to work in a department store. Soon after relocating to Birmingham, Ruth would marry the first of what would become her five husbands. After divorcing her first husband, Elder met and married Lyle Womack, an individual described only as an entrepreneur. The couple soon moved to Lakeland, Florida, where Elder obtained employment as a receptionist in the office of a dentist. Now, one of the most familiar symbols of the decade that would become known as the Roaring Twenties were young women, women called flappers, with bobbed hair and short skirts who drank, spoke, and used words not considered ladylike, a persona that Ruth Elder would soon adopt. The Roaring Twenties also represents the pinnacle of the golden age of flight, a period in which an aviator who achieved noteworthy milestones such as setting a speed record or altitude record became an overnight celebrity and media sensation. Caught up in the romance and glamour of aviators and their exploits, the 23-year-old elder visited the Lakeland Airport where she attempted to convince flying instructor George Hadelman to teach her to operate an aircraft. Hadelman would initially reject the idea, 
believing women to be unsuitable as aviators because they would inevitably end up crying about something. He finally relented, however, and Elder spent the next two years taking lessons as time and money permitted. In May 1927, an event occurred that would impact the life of Ruth Elder in ways the young woman from Anniston could never anticipate. A 25-year-old airmail air pilot named Charles Lindbergh astounded the world by flying nonstop across the Atlantic from New York to Paris. The flight would not only serve as a catalyst for an emerging aviation industry, but would inspire Ruth Elder to attempt to become the first woman to cross the Atlantic by airplane. In the weeks following her decision to replicate the epic flight of Charles Lindbergh, Elder received unexpected and welcome support when a group of West Virginia businessmen, recognizing an opportunity to take advantage of the publicity surrounding the Lindbergh flight, decided to provide financial resources to sponsor an attempt by a female aviator to cross the Atlantic. They reasoned that a profit could be made from the venture by marketing the publicity rights to motion picture companies and through product endorsements. The investor group faced two important decisions. First, selecting an airplane capable of making the flight, but equally important, finding the perfect female aviator who could capture the attention of the air-minded media. Ruth Elder, the young woman from Anniston, Alabama, proved to be the perfect face for the adventure. Feature articles in the newspaper proclaimed, with her wide smile, she looked exactly like the Pepsi toothpaste advertisements in contemporary magazines. Reporting on her announcement to fly across the Atlantic to Paris, the media would, media would describe Elder as the fairest of the brave and the bravest of the fair and labeled her the Miss America of Aviation and the Florida Flying Flapper. Because of her limited flying experience, Elder recruited her flying instructor, George Hadelman, as a crew member to accompany her on her flight. Ironically, the aircraft selected for the attempt was a Stinson Detroiter a single-engine monoplane designed and built by Eddie Stinson, brother of Alabama aviator Catherine Stinson. Elder named the airplane the American Girl. Arriving in New York in preparation for the flight, newspapers reported that Elder breezed into Long Island with the subtlety of a gale. The Alabama native almost never appeared without a rainbow huge scarf wrapped around her head in a manner that became known in New York fashion circles as a Ruth ribbon. Crossing the Atlantic Ocean by air in 1927 was an extremely dangerous endeavor. In the month of August alone, 16 people died making the attempt. Aircraft of the period lacked navigation and communication equipment. There was no radar tracking by our traffic control, no accurate weather reporting or forecasting. An elder could not depend on the availability of air sea rescue. Before being allowed to make the flight, she was required to obtain a pilot's license, complete a physical examination, demonstrate her proficiency as a pilot in the Stinson aircraft, all for the Department of Commerce inspectors. After numerous delays, Elder and Hadelman received official clearance for the flight on October 11th, 1927. On the morning of their departure, Elder boarded the aircraft with a food basket on her arm, appearing as though she were on her way to a picnic. In the pocket of her flying suit, she carried a complete vanity case with lipstick, rouge, and other cosmetics. She would explain, I want to get out of the airplane in Paris as cool and neat as I did at the start. I will powder my nose whenever I feel like it, flying or not flying. 
two rubber suits supposedly, and I emphasize supposedly, capable of keeping the aviators afloat for up to 72 hours in the frigid Atlantic Ocean were stored in the aircraft in the event of an emergency landing became necessary. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, I'm not sure I would trust uh, those suits uh, keeping me afloat. Ruth Elton would explain her reason for making the flight, stating, I've lived for a while without amounting to a plugged nickel. I want to do something that will make people notice me, that may give me an opportunity to get somewhere in the world. Departing from the same runway that Charles Lindbergh used for his flight to Paris, the American girl lifted off at five o'clock in the evening. The 500 spectators who had gathered to watch the takeoff cheered as the aircraft left the runway. In Anniston, the Anniston Star newspaper printed a special edition announcing Ruth Elder off for Paris. Throughout the first night of the flight, Elder and Hadelman took turns at the controls of the aircraft, often singing songs to pass the time. After 15 hours aloft, but less than halfway to Paris, the flight began to experience problems. The aircraft had been flying into a stronger than, uh, stronger than expected headwind since leaving New York, causing fuel consumption to be greater than anticipated. More troubling, the American girl began leaking lubricating oil, the lifeblood of the engine. By the second morning, 32 hours after takeoff, but still eight hours from the coast of England, Elder and Hadelman were faced with a potentially life-threatening decision. Continue to fly until the loss of engine oil caused the engine to fail or make an emergency landing on the surface of the ocean. As they prepared for the worst, they spotted a Dutch oil tanker, the first ship they had seen in more than 12 hours. Circling overhead the ship, they dropped a note onto the deck to advise the crew of their intention to make a landing in the water alongside the ship. Following a successful ditching of the aircraft, a wet and fatigued Elder and Hadelman were hoisted on board the ship. Shortly after they abandoned the American girl, the aircraft caught fire and sunk into a watery grave in the Atlantic Ocean. Elder would later state, it was like watching an old friend drowned. Elder and Hadelman would be taken by ship first to Portugal and then France. For publicity purposes, United Press International leased an airplane to allow Elder to complete the final segment of her journey by air, landing at Le Bourget Airdrome in Paris, her original destination. Upon her arrival in Paris, Elder was celebrated by an adoring public. I thought this was an interesting fashion statement by this young lady here, so. Elder's attempt to be the first woman to cross the Atlantic Ocean by air has been termed a glorious failure. Even though the flight did not reach its destination, it did represent an overwater endurance record of 2,623 miles, the longest flight ever made by a woman. Upon her return to New York City, Elder was met by adoring crowds, news reporters, and a ticker tape parade. Two days later, she attended a luncheon in Washington, D.C., hosted by President Calvin Coolidge. Other guests included Charles Lindbergh, and Amelia Earhart. Elder was also invited to return to Anniston for the Ruth Elder Day celebration. And I thought that was a really interesting postcard of the period of her posing there with Charles Lindbergh. Elder would capitalize on her fame by signing a contract for a 25-week tour of vaudeville shows and other appearances at the weekly rate of $5,000, a value of $90,000 in 2024 dollars. For Elder, the dream of a wider world that began on Noble Street in Anniston 
now led to the remote romantic appeal of Hollywood. After six months of stage performances, Elder left for Hollywood to star in silent films, including Moran of the Marines with Richard Dix and The Winged Horseman with Hoot Gibson. When not acting, hosting lunches, or attending parties, Ruth Elder continued to sharpen her flying skills. In August 1929, she joined 19 other female aviators in the very first Women's Air Derby from Santa Monica, California to Cleveland, Ohio. The route took the contestants over deserts and mountains as they navigated by rudimentary road maps and railroad tracks. Overcoming mechanical issues that resulted in a forced landing, Elder finished fifth of 14 aircraft that completed the 2,759 mile race. Amelia Earhart, the first woman uh, who would cross successfully cross the Atlantic Ocean airplane in 1928, but as a passenger, finished just two places ahead of Elder. Ruth Elder's aviation career included other notable events. Elder would become a founding member of the 99s, the Association of Female Aviators, and would remain a member until her death. The association obtained its name, the 99s, because 99 of the country's 117 female aviators became inaugural members. Today, that organization has more than 150 chapters around the world. Tragically, Ruth Elder's fast descent into the world of fame was paralleled only by her rapid descent from public view. For Elder, flying an airplane seemed to be the one aspect of her life that she could control. After earning an equivalent of more than $5 million in 2024 dollars, Ruth Elder would recall that the money slipped through my fingers and soon there was nothing. In 1955, the manager of the flight test division of the Hughes Aircraft Corporation received an unusual employment application to fill a vacant secretarial position. Now, although no one in the division recognized the name of the applicant, the application included the notation YWH, meaning you will hire. The applicant was Ruth Elder and the notation was made by reclusive billionaire Howard Hughes, who had an affinity for individuals who had achieved notable first in aviation. In a sense, Ruth Elder's life had come full circle, beginning as an unknown stenographer from a small Alabama town and ending as an unrecognized administrative secretary. Struggling with alcohol addiction, a string of failed marriages, and financial problems, Elder eventually found peace late in her life. In her final interview, Elder stated, flying is nice, but the earth has so many wonderful things in it to make people happy. The cool Northern California summers, walks on the beach, and the view of sailboats by the bay. Elder passed away peacefully at her home on October 9th, 1977, just two days shy of the 50th anniversary of her Atlantic flight attempt. In her obituary, the Associated Press observed, in the half century that followed her attempt to cross the Atlantic Ocean by airplane, Ruth Elder made movies, was hosted by a president, socialized with royalty, married six times, made a lot of money, and spent it all. <laughs> Fittingly, her ashes were spread over the Pacific Ocean by airplane. Amelia Earhart once wrote that some of us have great runways already built for us. If you have one, take off. But if you don't have one, Realize it is your responsibility to grab a shovel and build one for yourself and for those who will follow. Alabama's first ladies of flight, Catherine Stinson and Ruth Elder, 
not only built runways to fulfill their dreams, but also used those runways to create opportunity for future generations of women who shared their self-reliance, sense of adventure, and love of flight. I want to thank each of you for being with us today. It's been especially meaningful for me. And I want to thank the Alabama Department of Archives and History. And I want to also thank the uh, Alabama Heritage Magazine for their contributions to aviation history in the state. I really appreciate all of them. And I think we may have time for questions if you have any. Yes, we do have some time for questions. And if you're joining us online, you can submit your questions in the comments. It'll come to my phone and I can ask it on your behalf. But to start off, does anyone in the audience here have a question? Must have done a really good job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was wondering, are these in some way related to you? What was your interest in that? Two, two uh, reasons. One, I'm very, very interested in aviation history, but to answer your first question, I'm not related at all. Uh, I think that aviation history in Alabama specifically has never been researched to the extent it needs to be researched. And I thank Steve Murray and the Alabama Department of Archives and History for allowing us to establish a, a place to start compiling that information. Second part of your question, I think especially <laughs> women in aviation, specifically in Alabama, have never been recognized. And they have made, as you've seen, some remarkable contributions to aviation, not just in this state, but in this nation and in this world. And I would say, I think we have a relative uh, of Ruth sitting fourth row. <laughs> Two relatives, I'm sorry. <laughs> So uh, they could probably tell you a lot more about Ruth Elder than I could, although uh, I, I've done as much research as available. And again, just trying to make people aware of the rich aviation history that we have in the state. All right, there's no more questions. I oh, I couldn't see you behind that call. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed that. Uh, your book is The Hidden History of Alabama Aviation, and this is going to be a little bit like asking you to pick a favorite child or grandchild, but what's another story from your book that you could share with us today? Well, I will back up and answer that in a broader way. Um, I've always believed that history is comprised of building blocks of the major events that we all study in school. But what's interesting to me is any foundation has to be solid. And so we've got those building blocks, and by themselves, they do provide support, if you will, but it's the mortar in between those blocks that adds strength and stability. And stories like this have long been part of that mortar, that they are so important to adding to the overall stability of the history we build, but nobody knows about them. And there are tons of stories. I'll tell you one uh, that I really like that's in the book. When John F. Kennedy was president of the United States, his command pilot on Air Force One was from Birmingham. After the assassination and Lyndon Johnson took a, uh, office, his pilot, Air Force One, was from Andalusia, Alabama. So during the transition, you had two Alabama people sitting in the cockpit of Air Force One transporting Lyndon Johnson around the world. Uh, James Swindle, who was Kennedy's pilot, flew the, as we all remember, the flight back from Dallas after the assassination. And it it uh, it was really a, uh, an emotional thing for him, and it's emotional to read about it, and that's one of the stories in the book. Uh, another one is all the experimenters who preceded the Wrights in experimenting and, and flying machines in Alabama. Uh, that was a good one. Uh, a lot of Montgomery area, because that was kind of the central part of aviation in those years, but a lot of really neat stories, uh, one of which um, Zelda Fitzgerald, Zelda Sayer at the time, we talked about Taylor Field. All the cadets from Taylor Field would come over and buzz her house, trying to get her attention. And tragically, two people were killed doing it. 
So it's just little things like that that has always been intrigued me. And as I would research other parts of the history, I'd always make those notes and put them over here. And after a while, that pile got up to here. And so that's what became Hidden History of Alabama Aviation. We do have a question from our YouTube channel, uh, just about your research methods and especially how you were able to uncover sources about these two women. What kind of sources were you able to find about them to wow. be able to stitch together their life? Uh, a tremendous amount of online searching, uh, a tremendous amount of searching and researching through books, uh, talking to people that actually were related and knew her, uh, going through, wow, uh, pages and pages of newspaper articles. And it kind of gets back to the point that I made earlier. There's no central archive for this kind of thing. And that's what uh, Director Murray was so kind to let us do. I and my wife loved it. I took all of my stuff out of the house and brought it here. <laughs> so for them to deal with. But uh, my hope in that was to start trying to create uh, a central place that we could start archiving this stuff. And uh, for future researchers that I hope will pursue this. And this is one area of research that I would love to see people pursue. These are just, these are two stories. There are many, many, many more. We have one down here. So um, you can really tell from some of the fantastic images that you've shared today that there was a lot of press coverage of Catherine and Ruth. Can you talk a little bit about the cultural popularity of flying and how popular were they compared to like Amelia Earhart at the height of their careers? That's a great question. And, and the question, uh, just to repeat one aspect I want to cover, is uh, the popularity in Amelia Earhart specifically. To back up a little bit, Charles Lindbergh, when he flew the Spirit of St. Louis across the Atlantic, he used a Wright J-5 whirlwind engine. That's the same engine that Ruth Elder had on her airplane. And I've often wondered, what if that oil leak had not occurred? Would we even know who Amelia Earhart was today? I mean, it's just the little idiosyncrasies in history that changed people's paths in life. And I just thought if she had been successful or if Charles Lindbergh had developed the oil leak and she was the first to cross, this would be a remarkably different story. Now, in the 20s, which was the golden age of flight, as I mentioned, anything anybody did that was faster, higher, further, unique, the press was all over it. And so a lot of people have asked me, do you think Ruth Elder did this strictly as a publicity stunt. And I've thought a lot about that. And I will tell you that getting in an airplane in 1927 and without weather forecasting, without communication equipment, navigation equipment, all this stuff, I can't believe for one instant that this was a publicity stunt because they, when they took off, did not know where this trip was gonna end whether that was in the waters of the Atlantic in Paris. Lindbergh didn't even know he had reached the coast of Ireland until several minutes after he got there. Navigation was so rudimentary. So I think that she absolutely wanted to do something notable, and this was her opportunity to do that. Now, the second part of your question, the newspapers, this was a very unique thing. And I want you to remember that when uh, Amelia Earhart made, became the first woman to cross, she was a passenger. She, she didn't actually fly an airplane across until 1932. So Ruth in 1927 was actually flying the airplane. So this was incredibly newsworthy. And it was unusual because you didn't, well, when even after the flight, there were only 117 female pilots in the United States. So uh, there were less than that when she made the flight. And I think it was incredibly newsworthy. And they followed it very closely. Does that answer your question? I hope um, Billy, what, I know that Ruth didn't uh, didn't have the means, wasn't born with the means to uh, monetarily to do this, and she came by those. What was Catherine's family more affluent, or was her mother just a savvy business person? What there are a lot of stories, and and I you'll read in Catherine Stinson that there was one story that she sold her piano tape flying lessons, and a lot of build up like that. Her sister Marjorie says no. That never happened. Apparently, her mother was very 
uh, business savvy and was not hesitant to relocate her family to where opportunities presented themselves. Now they did among family accumulate the money to go into business, but uh, I think they were much more affluent than Ruth. Ruth, uh, just when she made the flight, we're only two years away from the great financial depression of, of 1929. Uh, her house uh, on Noble Street in Aniston was just a wood frame, nondescript place. And uh, one thing I would like to do, take this step further, is to research her earlier life because I don't know a lot about her coming up other than she was a vibrant child and liked to be the center of attention. But uh, I think if she had not been able, sometime in history, things align just right to make events possible. And if Ruth had not been able to get the financial backing of the West Virginia folks, probably could not have, have pulled everything together to make the flight. But she was wanting to do this. They saw an opportunity. Let's be frank, they were going to try to publicize this and make money, but it gave her the avenue to make the flight. So I think uh, two different things. Uh, Catherine probably started a little ahead of the game in the ability to finance what she was doing, where Ruth did not. Uh, when she was taking flying lessons in Lakeland, she could not even afford to get a license. And, but she, uh, the uh, Department of Commerce required her to do that before the uh, Atlantic attempt. And that's why I say this wasn't a publicity stunt. She had to work very hard to prove herself in New York before she ever left for that flight. I had to become licensed. Uh, she had to fly with Department of Commerce inspectors, all of this stuff, to prove her ability as a pilot. Thank you. Yep. Please join me in once again thanking Mr. Billy Simmons. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. And thank you to all of you who came out and also who joined us online. I hope to see you again next month uh, as Mike Bunn presents on uh, the historic Blakely State Park. Thank you. Thank you.